Loop on the Third Bye Bye Lady Liberty, also known as Bye Bye Liberty Crisis or Goodbye Lady Liberty, is the first TV special in the Lupin series originally airing in April 1989. Directed by Osamu Tezaki and written by Hiroshi Kashiwabara, it represents somewhat of a turning point in the franchise. Not only is it the last animated Lupin project released in the 80s, but it's also the first of many television movies starring our favorite thief that aired while new Lupin TV shows were put on hold until the 2010s. In addition to the new medium, Lady Liberty also brings back some of the eccentricities of works like The Mystery of Mamo, where the story takes second place to exploring complex themes and concepts. Undoubtedly, TMS wanted to create a huge impact with Lupin's first TV special, bringing in a number of talented people to work on it. First off, the regular voice cast was brought back after they were bypassed for Fuma Conspiracy, which I'm sure delighted everyone. TMS also hired people like the late director Osamu Dezaki, assistant director Toshiya Shinohara, writer Hiroshi Kashiwabara, and art director Mitsuki Nakamura. Dezaki was a noteworthy animator and director who got his start with works like Astro Boy, Moomin, and Ashito no Jo. He had previously created storyboards for Lupin Part 1 and later signed on as a director for four more Lupin specials, then being involved in minor roles on a few others during his lifetime. Even by 1989, his reputation within the anime industry was significant, and undoubtedly picking a big name to herald Lupin's first TV movie was a big draw even outside the series' fanbase. As for Kashiwabara, he had previously written for a few TV shows, including Lupin Part 3, and would later go to write the screenplays for nine TV specials and two movies for the Lupin series, as well as a few Godzilla movies. The staff went in a bit of an odd direction, by focusing less on story and more on big thrills while also bringing it somewhat back to the expected Lupin tropes. This is the final Lupin media released in the 1980s and, in many ways, goes against the trend of Lupin media to experiment during this decade. Compared to the science fiction concept of the cancelled Loop on the Eighth spin-off and the wackier tone of Part 3 in Gold of Babylon, this one reorients the series more or less to the tone and narrative style of classic Lupin. If Fuma Conspiracy represents a partial shift back towards Lupin's roots, Lady Liberty pulled in the reins even harder while still daring to go off on its own path. For instance, we're back to Red Jacket Lupin this time, although the pink tie of Part 2 has been replaced with the yellow tie of Mamo, a better choice in my opinion. As for why TMS went the TV special route in the first place, when Nippon Television re-ran Part 2 for the first time in the fall of 1988, it returned great ratings, which convinced them that Lupin had plenty of potential in the realm of TV animation. The company wanted to target both old-time fans and younger audiences that were introduced to the series through those reruns. Monkey Punch was even consulted for the story, and pitched a concept around computer viruses and a child computer prodigy, which Kashiwabara ran with while including a story about the Lupin gang stealing the Statue of Liberty. The finished work, Bye Bye Lady Liberty, was broadcast on April 1st, 1989 as part of Nippon TV's Saturday Super Special, a two-hour program block for unique one-off productions. This segment hosted shows like baseball games, award shows, special interest pieces, and occasionally, anime films and manga adaptations. This program block wouldn't last too long after this film premiered, ending in 1990, with the rest of the loop on TV specials airing on another program block, The Friday Roadshow. While Lady Liberty had the lowest audience share of the TV specials until 2012's Another Page, it was successful enough to guarantee another loop on the third special would debut on Japanese TVs every year until 2013. <laughs> When I first watched this special during my Lupin binge two years ago, I honestly didn't know what to think of it. It mostly struck me as boring, with not enough interesting character development, high-stakes drama, or flashy set pieces to make it stand out. Did I discover something new upon re-watching Lady Liberty that made me finally appreciate it? Nope. Let's start with the plot. Lady Liberty begins with Lupin infiltrating police headquarters in Paris to steal computer files with info on him and his associates, though as he finds out, that data is backed up in so many areas around the globe that it's basically pointless to go after it. 
Having seen Lupin fall into a slump, Jigen brings him along on a heist to steal a gem known as the Super Egg, hidden by Jigen's old partner inside the Statue of Liberty. But as they work on this job, they meet a kid named Michael who wants Lupin to steal a computer virus. Specifically, this virus can alter and erase other viruses, and would allow Lupin to erase all the police data he wanted from across the globe. All the while, there's a woman named Isabel who meets up with Goemon in Alaska, and whom is being pursued by agents of a shadowy organization known as the Three Masons. And yes, if you didn't pick up on that incredible pun, and I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't until writing that sentence just now, they're basically Freemasons. Isabel is actually the second of the three Masons, on the run after double-crossing the other two, who are hot on her trail. Fujigo has meanwhile been trying to infiltrate their ranks to steal their stockpile of jewels, but between her being captured and the rest of the Lupin crew protecting Isabel, the gang has quite the strange case on their hands. Oh, and Zenigata is there too. This is certainly a more modern take on Lupin, or modern for the times anyways, taking direct inspiration from contemporary events and advancements in technology. With some exceptions, Lupin has always had a nostalgic, set someone in the past feeling to it, not necessarily historical, but never explicitly tied to the present. Lady Liberty subverts that by telling a more of the time story, with elements and plot points that were fresh and innovative. It begins with a drawing of Lupin done on a then-new Macintosh computer, for instance, which I've heard was Monkey Punch's computer of choice, and one of the chief treasures this time around is a computer virus. Back in 1989, the general public was becoming more aware of viruses and their destructive potential for the ever-expanding home computer market, so tapping into that as a major plot point made perfect sense even if it seems a little antiquated nowadays. This is also one of the first Lupin stories to ask the question, can Lupin survive in the present day? Obviously, the present day of 1989 is far different than that of 2018's Part 5, which really examined this question in detail, but the overarching themes are still there. It isn't as tied into the plot, however, mostly just being a sort of introductory hook to get the story started, and then just being a background note. It's also an angle for the villains, a secret society that has only survived for centuries because they've mastered multiple dark arts over the years, but are in danger of losing everything because they need control over the virus. Compared to the Lupin gang, which works heavily on instinct, their plotting, methodical ways make them a natural target of opposition. This also makes it a more personal journey for Lupin in particular, as this is one of many adventures he undertakes simply because he's broke. Lupin has an incredible success rate when it comes to thievery, but because of his lavish lifestyle and lust for women who are usually only interested in his money, he constantly racks up debt. It doesn't help that he almost always loses the treasures he steals or they end up having only sentimental value, and when the police can literally predict and track his every movement, his methods might seem quaint by comparison. Lupin isn't even very interested in the super egg treasure this time around. He's only in the initial chase for the money, something that rarely ever seriously attracts him as he wants the thrill of the theft as well. The questions Lady Liberty raises about Lupin's sustainability and relevance are interesting for sure, and if you were to dig deep into it, you might find plenty of stuff to chew on. Unfortunately, while Lady Liberty does have some intriguing concepts, I find that it falls apart at the most basic levels. This one barely pays attention to its story most of the time, especially towards the end, just hitting the beats it needs to in order to get from point A to point B, without caring enough about its plot or characters. So many plot elements are lazily explained through expository dialogue instead of being delivered in a natural way, telling, not showing. Like for example, who are the main villains? A group who seeks to control the world with a mountain of gems at their disposal. And I know this because Fujiko straight up says as such at one point, speaking to herself with nobody else in the room. There's two divergent stories here which do eventually meet, but the way it does feels very forced, like the plots for two separate projects were smashed together to create a whole new work. I have no evidence to support that idea, of course, but the end result is that Lady Liberty is a wholly uneven work, often falling flat because the glue holding the structure together doesn't exist. There isn't a ton of relevant connection between each scene, as if the movie is meandering towards its destination and only guessing where the story is heading. Even the characters don't always know why they go where they go, it's like this plot is questioning why it needs to hop around from place to place. I can at least appreciate the attention to making the characters a little more well-rounded this time, as some, but not all, of the main crew have been beefed up a bit. 
Lupin is a little kinder and more cooperative this time, not necessarily a more tender or emotional character, but one who's willing to go on a journey for more than just personal gain. That's still there, of course, but his interactions with the side characters show a more complex side of him than other works. And after multiple stories where he felt completely sidelined, Jigen is actually a significant upgrade here. He's not a major presence for the entire plot, but he's far more dedicated to the adventure this time around. More scenes put him in the spotlight, and unlike Gold of Babylon and Fuma Conspiracy, where he felt shoehorned in because he's contractually obligated to appear, he's actually dedicated to the job and even kicks off part of the story. For the rest of the main cast, though, they still don't reach their full potential. It's great to see Fujiko take charge again, but towards the end, she's essentially discarded and is only barely involved for the finale, which is a damn shame. Goemon has yet another romance, and it is nowhere near as developed as it should be. Without spoiling the story, it doesn't feel like there's any connection between these two, and I understand that's somewhat intentional, but I wish Goemon wasn't pigeonholed into this kind of storyline all the time. And man, if there was ever a movie where Zenigata didn't need to be involved, it was this one. He's only in a couple of scenes and feels so much like a tag-along, and listen, I love the guy, but he does absolutely nothing that couldn't be fulfilled by another character. As for the newcomers, it's a bit of a mixed bag. The child Michael actually isn't too bad, which, for me, is a rarity for kid characters in Lupin. While he does exemplify the child-hacking genius trope, which is one I don't care for, he is charming enough to make it work. Isabel is another decent addition. It's great seeing another confident woman in this story, and while I don't much like the conclusion to her arc, the personality is enough for me to like her. I can't say the same about the villains, though. Jimmy is the typical rich slimeball who's incredibly uninteresting, and number one is this old-as-heck man who tortures others with his, uh, stinky breath? I'm genuinely confused why they went this route. It's just too weird for me. And it gets even crazier with the English dub, and I do not mean that in a good way. It was produced by Manga Entertainment UK, whose work on Mamo and Castle of Cagliostro we've previously discussed, and whose version of Lady Liberty was released in 1996. The cast came from Worldwide Sound, the same dubbing studio behind Manga UK's Mamo dub, and as such, it shares the same voice actors with that project. And this one also had George Rubikek running the dubs, a man not knowing for sticking closely to the original subtitles, which works to this dub's detriment. The script suffers a ton from dialogue changes and added bits of humor, which, even if they land for you, don't really gel with the mood of the story. Like, instead of calling them the Three Masons, the villains are called Conquer the Universe Incorporated, which wouldn't be a bad name if this was a parody or a comedy sketch, but it's not, so it is. And every change to the lines makes these characters seem way too awful, even considering their status as thieves. There's a running gag with Zenigata where he's constantly too broke to pay for cab rides, yet at least offers to reimburse the charges, but in the dub, it turns him into a jackass who doesn't believe in tipping and always argues with the people giving him a ride. Not too much to complain on the voice acting side beyond my earlier notes in the Mamo video, except for whatever reason, I found the late William Dufresne pretty insufferable as Lupin this time. He's way too snivelly and cocky here, and the performance isn't as restrained in instances where the delivery should be more subtle, even if the tone fits the character well. Despite the otherwise alright casting, I'd avoid this dub at all costs. The script just makes this already not stellar special that much more intolerable. This is another work like Gold of Babylon that wants to ride on the coattails of its kooky storyline rather than piece everything together logically. But unlike Mamo, where the bizarre storytelling enhanced what it wanted to say about Lupin as a character, Lady Liberty just goes absolutely batshit by the end with no substance to back it up. It's apparently a choice influenced heavily by Dezaki, whose time in the director's chair often spiraled out from Kashiwabara's more traditional script, and this wasn't a popular decision with everyone on staff. Series supervisor Junichi Ioka, who worked on Lady Liberty as a scenario director, cited Dezaki's style as occasionally distracting or contrary to the film's intent. For the record, I have no problem with Lupin going in wild direction, so long as it's done with purpose and serves the story it's telling. I can't find any purpose for the jumbled storytelling in Lady Liberty other than perhaps the production team not being able to tie everything together. Or maybe they put more attention on the art and animation instead, and to its credit, Lady Liberty does look very good for the most part. 
From my recollection, the majority of Lupin TV specials don't put too much budget into the visuals and can sometimes look fairly cheap as a result, but that's not the case here. I really love the color palette and the shading looks absolutely incredible, muted in the best ways, creating a rougher look that's emblematic of late 80s, early 90s anime. And the character designs by Noboru Furusei, a key animator on Mamo, also stick out to me. They take quite a bit of inspiration from the original manga in body proportions while still being nice and fluid. According to Furusei, he deliberately used Mamo as a reference for the character designs here, and the long face, tall leg style would be retained for the next few TV specials as well. Though I will say that the way shoulders are drawn does bother the hell out of me, and some characters like Goemon just look awful in a couple of shots. A lot of these specific animation techniques here can be traced back to Tezaki, a noteworthy director whose style is in full effect here. If nothing else, Lady Liberty offers a distinctive look in the Lupin series that emphasizes a blend between soft and hard edges, plenty of Dutch angles, and complex lighting. Some scenes look absolutely gorgeous, and that's a testament to the entire art team, from the animators to the designers and colorists who all work to create something truly unique within the series. Nothing in this special animation-wise is particularly groundbreaking, but for a film that's over 30 years old, it's incredible how modern it looks despite the fidelity. And this being a Dezaki work, of course some of his trademarks are gonna carry over. There's plenty of harmony cells in this one, which are pretty neat even if they lose their luster by the end. I especially like the split-screen shots that give the scenes a comic-style flair. There's sadly not a lot of these shots, but they're always really cool to see. A lot of shots are rendered with shadow and lighting effects that obscure some of the finer details, but also heighten a darker or more intense mood. It looks great when it comes to the environments, casting everything in a beautiful glow, but it can sometimes be a little distracting, especially when it's used to hide objects in the foreground, but it's a nice bit of detail that I can appreciate. But I actually do like the audio design here, as the attention to detail in the sound makes some of these scenes really pop, enhancing the mood in ways you don't often get with the Lupin series. There's one scene in particular early on where Jigen shoots a couple of goons and it's all set to the sound of a passing subway train with no gunshots or screams to be heard, a more artistic depiction of what otherwise would be a standard sequence. Had it been paired with a better crafted or more interesting story, it would honestly improve my opinion of this work significantly. It's that good. Not much to say about the music this time, as I think Yuji Ono's work here is little more than passable. None of the songs really stand out for my tastes, with two exceptions. There's the variation on the classic Lupin theme, the Lupin Theme 89, which is one of my all-time favorite renditions of this composition. It's hard-hitting and thumping with a slower but heavier beat, and that bombastic feeling is a delight for the ears. And then we have the ending theme, Endless Twilight, composed by Ono, with lyrics by Yoshiko Miura and vocals by Akemi Kaida. This theme is such a pleasant little ballad that's so soft and relaxing that I can't help but just mellow out when I listen to it. That aside though, the music felt more like just background noise to me, and I can't say I cared a lot about the music here. And really, that describes my feelings on Bye Bye Lady Liberty as a whole, I just don't care that much about it. The script doesn't hold up under scrutiny, the melding of its storylines is far from smooth, and it's too much style over too little substance. Really, it's more dull than anything else, as there just isn't enough interesting content here, and to be honest, it was difficult for me to write the script for this one without just saying this is boring over and over again. There's a few things I like, such as the animation and sound, and there is an appropriate sense of tension, I suppose, but otherwise it plods along to an unsatisfying end without giving us enough good material to hook onto. Lady Liberty almost seems like it's trying to make a huge impression as the first TV special by telling a far from simple story with outlandish themes, but when the way that story is told isn't layered enough to match its ambitious ideas, the foundation crumbles to pieces and the end result suffers horribly as a result. But there isn't much that I outright hate either, and I can appreciate that Lady Liberty tried to be more than just a TV movie. Many Lupin specials feel very stock, trying desperately to capture the magic of part two and only occasionally really succeeding. Some early specials did avoid sticking to the established patterns, and I commend Lady Liberty for trying. But there's nothing here that you couldn't find in Mystery of Mamo, a movie that tackles many of the same overarching ideas and which, in my eyes, is infinitely better. 
Many of the same crew worked on the next TV special, The Hemingway Papers, which I do remember fondly, so we'll see if they improved with that one next time. For now, if you enjoyed this video, then give it a like, leave a comment, and be sure to subscribe and click that bell to be notified when new videos go live. I've got a couple more Loop On videos planned for this year, so hope you're ready for me to talk about even more Loop On The Third specials. Until next time, this is Cloud Connection, 